Hi, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. We have a, a slightly different kind of presentation today. I know normally we have, uh, we share different works in progress. Um, today we were very fortunate to have a special conversation about sickle cell from a personal perspective. And a lot of folks on the CERT team um, worked hard to put this together. Um, so we'll have Michael Coffey do the introductions and Ezra and Takume will be um, leading the discussion with, with us all. So uh, Michael. Thank you so much, Dr. R. Young, and thank you, Juan. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to anyone joining from the East Coast. Um, as part of the community engagement and research programs, the community partner and faculty gathering, I have the honor and the pleasure of introducing Mr. Lendrick Holmes, a father, husband, and survivor of the prevalent sickle cell disease. Lendrick joins us this morning from Mobile, Alabama, where he still volunteers with the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America. We are excited to journey with Mr. Holmes as he describes the successes and challenges of navigating a two-year gene therapy clinical trial with the National Institutes of Health. My colleague, Edgero Takume, will help lead discussions around Mr. Holmes' journey. Please be sure to place any questions you have in the chat. There will also be a Q&A um, after, after the discussion, sorry. With that being said, and without further ado, I'm excited to hand the mic over to my colleague, Edgero Takume. Thank you so much, Michael. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I, I am so excited to be able to have a conversation with Alindric Holmes. Um, but before we do, I do want to take a moment to uh, briefly uh, touch on um, sickle cell. Uh, so I will wait for my colleague to pull up those slides so we can go ahead and get started. Wonderful. All right. Um, so we're going to do a really quick Sickle Cell 101 crash course um, into what it is before we have our conversation. Next slide, please. Great. So I, I'm going to give you a brief introduction into sickle cell disease, and I'll talk a little bit more about the impact of the disease on the individual. Then I'll highlight and briefly touch on gene therapy, which will segue us into our conversation with Lindrick. Next slide. Okay. So sickle cell, what is it, right? It is an inherited condition that's passed down from the parent to their children through genes. And it's also a genetic disorder that affects hemoglobin, which is the molecule in red blood cells that delivers oxygen to cells throughout the body. And it's also important to note that this, sickle, this disease is most prominent in individuals of African descent and Hispanic descent. Specifically, one out of 365 Black or African-American births are impacted by sickle cell, and one out of 16,300 Hispanic American births um, experience a child with sickle cell. Next slide, please. Next. Okay. Now, if you can recall earlier, I mentioned that sickle cell is a genetic disorder that affects hemoglobin, which is a molecule in the red blood cells that delivers oxygen throughout the body. An individual with, without sickle cell has a normal red blood cell, which is round and flexible, allowing the blood to flow easily and smoothly through the blood vessels, which you can clearly see here on the image to the left. An individual that has sickle cell, on the other hand, hand has red blood cells that are crescent or moon-shaped. And this shape makes it challenging for blood to flow easily through blood vessels and can create a backup or blockage of blood flow throughout the body. Next slide, please. Now, an individual with sickle cell disease can experience an array of complications, some of which include pain crises, which are prolonged periodic pain episodes of extreme pain that develop when sickle-shaped red blood cells block the blood flow through tiny blood vessels to the chest, abdomen, and joints. The pain varies in intensity and can last for a few hours or sometimes even days. Uh, individuals with sickle cell also experience issues such as anemia, frequent swelling in the hands and feet, frequent infections, um, shortened lifespan, and delayed growth in many children. Now, the impact of sickle cell disease has an array of emotional and social impacts, not only on the individual that experiences this, lives with this disease, but on the families that are connected to or caring for the individual, which include challenges in school, work, and social interactions. Next slide, please. Now, I want to briefly transition into gene therapy and its role in providing a solution for sickle cell disease. 
Now, imagine if we could fix or swap out a broken part inside our body cells, like fixing a part in a car. That's what this new treatment called gene therapy is trying to do. With sickle cell disease, the problem is with a specific gene that doesn't work right. This broken gene causes the red blood cells to be misshapen and can lead to a lot of health issues like we, like I mentioned earlier. Now, gene therapy aims to either fix this broken gene or add a new one that works properly so the body can make normal, healthy red blood cells again. Next slide, please. Gene therapy treatment has the potential to reduce or eliminate the symptoms of sickle cell disease and could represent a major breakthrough in treating sickle cell disease. However, there is a long history of mistrust in healthcare and research, especially within communities of color, such as those impacted by sickle cell disease. This context makes the personal stories of those who bravely navigated these waters even more powerful and essential. With that in mind, it is my absolute privilege to introduce our guest, Lindrick Holmes, who has firsthand experience participating in a gene therapy clinical trial for sickle cell disease. Lindrick's journey offers us invaluable insights into the realities of pioneering treatments, the challenges faced, and the hope that it brings to many. Lindrick, welcome again. It is a pleasure to have you with us today, and we'd love to hear more about you and your story. Can you share a little bit more about your personal journey with sickle cell? First off, good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Uh, I like that picture because I used to have a hairline. I ain't got it no more. <laughs> Mind me of the days when I used to have to get haircuts. But uh, sickle cell has shaped me and molded me in a lot of ways. And I think that Anybody who has a disease or any type of chronic ailment, you know, lifelong can tell you that uh, they probably wouldn't be who they are if it wasn't for the complications that come along with the disease. It's a unique experience. So um, it, <laughs> it is all I've known, you know, for a long time. Um, but I've always fought, fought against it. My, my relationship with sickle cell is a lot different than a lot of people that I've, that I've known with yeah. uh that live with sickle cell as well mm -hmm. i've always been like a rebellious spirit because there's so much of my life that i wasn't able to experience because of sickle cell yeah. and um like anybody you know you don't want you you know what you are i remember i don't know i was watching this tv show and yeah. um this guy was talking about his experience of being a slave and how mm -hmm. he broke free from mm -hmm. slavery, he said the only thing that he knew for sure, the difference between him and the people he left behind is that he knew he wasn't a slave. Mm -hmm. And I just knew that it's just what this lifestyle that, that, that sickle cell forces upon you, mm -hmm. that society forces upon you, this this negative tent that, that people look at you as, yeah. it just, it didn't fit me. So uh, I fought and I'm blessed because I'm here. Yeah. You, you mentioned, Lindrick, that there is this um, this this image um, that society puts on you as an individual with its sickle cell. You know, can you now just to kind of give folks con um, help folks kind of have more insight? How did this impact your your childhood, um, your adolescence and even your adulthood? Uh, it's like one of those things where. <laughs> You you kind of like just just imagine like being famous for something stupid on TikTok, right? And <laughs> and like you, you, there's so much more to you as a person. There's so much more to you as a human being. But yeah. every time someone sees you, they identify with what they see on TikTok. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And and so and so sickle cell kind of like took over as far as like the significance of of my life and what I wanted and who mm -hmm. I was. It, it had a persona of its own. So when people saw me, they didn't see me. They saw yeah. what the disease meant to them. Mm -hmm. they, they saw um, another, if you were close to me, a lot of people who, you know, who loved me, who cared about me, they saw something uh, that was a burden, something they had to deal mm -hmm. with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, uh, another liability. You know, they, they, saw, they saw what came with sickle cell disease yeah. and they see me as a person. Yeah, which I can only imagine can be so frustrating, um, especially when you're going through some of the signs and like the symptoms of, of sickle cell disease. I think one that is 
the most common um, that you know I, I've seen is just those pain crises and those pain episodes um, that are very unpredictable, and you just never know when they're going to happen. And they they tend to I can imagine happen at the the most inopportune times. Can you kind of walk us through um, or help us visualize like what it is feel what it's like to experience a pain crisis or a pain episode um, when as an individual that has sickle cell? It's a uh, it's an ambivalent type of fear. Um, and I say ambivalent because it's it's fear mixed with shame. You can say it's very dangerous. Um, what I mean by that is, it's like it's fear because you anticipate this great wave of pain, wherever, and you um, there's really no control you have. You know what I'm saying? And it's shame because of the way that people look at you and treat you afterwards. Um. I one one specific memory that I, I keep repeating um a lot in different interviews is this one time um where me and my sister we came from you know <laughs> we came from 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 the ghetto you know what I mean at that time we didn't really have much uh we came from a place uh called Gulf Village in um Pritchard Alabama it's yeah. really it's really awful place but I, I just say that you know to try to, you know, disclaim, like, we didn't really have that childhood, so whenever my auntie gave us an opportunity to go to Bush Gardens in, uh, in Virginia, we were super excited, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the trip there was hard, and I felt a lot of crises along the way, but as a child, I had been through, I was already, like, traumatized from I wouldn't, yeah, I, I would say, yeah, I guess traumatized is, is adequate, where I was very traumatized from um, yeah. people's responses to me having sickle cell crisis in very inopportune times. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so when I felt those pains, I was just like, hold it in, <laughs> hold it in. Uh, but when we finally got there after, I don't know how long that drive was, like a 16 hour drive, I don't know, it was a long drive. Yeah. Um, finally got there and it was a major sickle cell crisis, but I still played it off. Oh you know, I don't need to go to the hospital. Just give me some pain medicine. Okay. Uh, it, it was the shame that I felt because I knew, like, I didn't want to ruin this for my little sister. I didn't want to ruin this for everybody. This is, this is in my mind at that time, I, I think I was like seven or eight years old. I was like, I don't want to ruin everyone else's life, you know? And so even though um, the pain itself going along with sickle cell, it, it, it makes you, you know, you feel the threat of death when you when you go yeah. through that level of pain. You feel like, oh, and I make it through this when I hope I, you start praying. I had this poem I used to say at that time. I had wrote when I was 15. It, it wasn't like, you know, when I was eight. I wrote it when I was 15. I ended up saying it every time I would go into a sickness or a crisis as a prayer. Uh, because, you know, I I never knew if it was going to be my last time. And um, so, but uh, my the shame that came along with of uh, ending my sister's joy and my family's effort to bring us so far out of the way that shame uh, overshadowed my fear of that of death and pain. So, like I say, it's very ambivalent um, because of the social aspect of it. You know, a lot of times you don't when you have sickle cell, you don't really have the luxury of just thinking about uh, the 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 physical implications. You don't really, you don't really think about the damage that's happening to your body. You don't care. You know what I mean? You don't care. It's not even that you don't think about it. You know, if you're educated about it, you you know, hey, this this is bad. I need help. I could die. But uh, it's just because of society and yeah. that pressure. You just don't want to be seen like that. That's that yeah. was a harder fight trying to fight to be seen for me. Than, than fighting against the disease itself in some, yeah. some aspects of my life. Yeah, and um, gosh, you know, thank you for just, you know, kind of expanding on just, you know, the emotions that that come with, you know, experiencing those pain episodes. And um, there are a few things I, I do want to um, just kind of touch, circle back on, um, but I will just um, ask, and I and I know this, and Lindrick, if you do not want to, you do not have to, I can go to the next question, but 
you know, can you, um, with regards to like what it feels like, is there like a, any, is there a word or like something, like a, something descriptive you can use to kind of help people understand like the feeling of a, of a crisis, like when it happens, like physically? Uh, I had this memory that I, I went over, uh, I was talking to my lady about it yesterday. Uh, I was five years old, begging for death. Um, I don't think there's there's a way you can describe that type of pain. Uh, it 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 seizes your body. You don't have control, uh, and the pain just kind of like just rapes your lungs. You, you can't you can't really breathe, you can't really think. Um you can't really focus on anything but hoping either the pain stop or your life stops. It's it's pretty bad. Uh I, I, I know it, before I've described it as like uh barbed wires flowing through your veins, um razor blade, razor blades tan tan up your flesh. It there's a lot of different ways. It just depends on where the sickle cell crisis is. Um, yeah. it, it affects you differently depending, well, it affects me differently depending on where the crisis was. If the crisis, like for instance, I got uh, a vascular necrosis in my left hip because I've had so many crises in that area and, you know, it just depleted the bone marrow, you know? And um, so, after a while, having sickle cell crisis there, it didn't hit as hard. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got you got numb in, in certain areas, but uh, man, that would just it just it just it just depends. But every time, you know, is it's like it's like you're blindfolded and you know you're gonna get hit, but you don't know where, yeah. and you don't know how hard. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's what it's like. You know, you can just imagine being like captured by terrorists and tortured and you don't know where the lick is going to come how hard it's going to be and if you're going to survive you don't know when they're going to come back into the room you know that's what it's like with living with um sickle cell that pain is just is indescribable it's 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 variable you don't know and that anticipation makes the pain like a thousand words you don't know and when you're finally there you don't know when it's going to stop you know there have been time i had sickle cell crisis the pain was so severe i had to get I had to go to ICU just so they can administer the type of pain medicine that they could to try to control my pain. Cause you know, I was screaming, hyperventilating. Uh, it, it was, it was terrible and embarrassing. Oh. <laughs> Super embarrassing. Thank you so much for um, that description and, um, you know, walking through us. I, I, can only I can't even imagine and um you know just being so open with you know what that what that feels like um you mentioned earlier you just briefly touched on you know how um others treated you you know what when you when you had your, your crises or when you had your episodes um can you just elaborate a little or can you kind of share a little bit more about you know what a, a person with sickle cell disease from your perspective experiences from different different people and i know you talked about the experience with your sister um and your family um and how you didn't want to ruin things for them and um, but you know what is what was the response from you know maybe your family members and if you can also um, after you share that the response from you know providers you know when you would go in for your crises and and other individuals that it made you feel a certain type of way. Uh, well, well, first in response to how people acted um, over time, uh, they were exhausted with me, and um, it was frustrating for me as a kid because you know, as an adult, I'm so articulate now, but as a kid, I did not have the ability to describe what was going on in my life what was happening, um, you know, there was no rhyme or reason. And after a while, people just saying, why? And because around me, people in my life were so uneducated about 
not just sickle cell disease, but just about just medical stuff in general, they had like these superstitious pseudo kind of belief systems that they invented in their head as in reasons why we're going sickle cell crisis. Oh, you went outside with your shirt off. Oh, you got caught in the rain. You know you should have been like with your umbrella at. They just count, they got up with all these kind of things to try to describe like in their mind, like there's something I did wrong in order for me to go through a crisis. Yeah. Uh, but as far as like how I got a general response, uh, yeah, there's one story. Um, I, I went to a school, an elementary school called Asha Nurse um, in like the, the 90s. And um, I I, I kind of, in hindsight, I think it's kind of ridiculous I went through this uh, because I think the AIDS crisis was more of an 80s thing. <laughs> but for some reason back then, the students and staff associated sickle cell disease with AIDS and they treated me like I was contagious. And mm -hmm. I got bullied severely. I got bullied so bad uh, that I, I would fake sickle cell crises just so I can get out of school. I did not want to go to school at all. It was that terrible. And it didn't spare me either. I would get beat up. Um, I was talking to my grandma about this. We're trying to get her to remember this because, you know, she getting a age, so she couldn't remember it. But it was one time, it was this dude named Raisin Nick. We call him Raisin Nick. He had a big ass mole on his neck right there. I used to, that was my way of fighting back. I used to, in Mobile, Alabama, we call him Jenkins. You know, y'all may call him <laughs> Rolston, Jonesing. <laughs> that was my way of fighting back, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't always have the physical strength, you know. Um, yeah. It was always a risk to fight because it would lead to sickle cell complications and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I still fought, though. I had no choice in a lot of it. But for, before it even got to that, I would shame people by, by tearing down their self-esteem. And I did that with Raising. Like, I still don't know his real name to this day. <laughs> but wow. um, he was so frustrated with me because who am I? I'm this sickle cell AIDS guy, you know, yeah. uh, who am I to be talking about him like that? I ain't got no right, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he followed me after school, walking to my car when my grandma and my mama was picking me up and he popped five me right there for years, right there from my grandma. He said, Put out! <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my God. Out of me, man. I'll never forget that. That was oh, a Lord. He was bigger than me too. Like, yeah, and I think it, we was in like the fifth grade, and bro had to be like six foot. Wow! He oh was my god, he was a big boy. He was pretty big. Man, I can I just still fall back, but I got beat up in front of my grandma. So you ain't gonna never forget that. <laughs> oh god, the you ain't gonna never forget that. You get beat up in front of mama. Nah. Oh man, memories yeah. for days. I can imagine, and I think, um, oh good lord, that's that's so that's so frustrating. Um. Yeah. And, and also, too, I know you mentioned, um, you know, having to go to the hospital and, you know, like just the whole experience with, you know, requesting um, pain medicine. And uh, what was that experience like or, or the response of, you know, healthcare providers and physicians when when you were having your episodes? Well, uh, first, I want to I want to uh, highlight that there's a huge difference between pediatric care and adult care. Okay. If you have sickle cell disease and you go through pediatric care, there is all this kind of love and accommodation and all this kind of stuff. You don't really need to know anything about what kind of treatment you need, what kind of, you don't even know anything. They put that, they default that on to like your, your parents and your caregivers and they do everything for you. Oh, cute little Benji. I remember distinctly uh, two experiences, two, two, two experiences that showed me, that gave me a wake up call. And they pretty much reminded me, you on your own. If you die, you die. They turned to they turned to that Russian from from Rocky. If you die, you die. Um, number one, and still hurts me to this to this day. I wouldn't say hurts. I forgive him. I forgive him. Um, you know, I, I don't really hold no grudges, but that that hurt me deeply because in pediatric care there was a doctor. I don't know if I should say her name because it might start some stuff. But I, mean, I say her name. <laughs> it might start some stuff. But yeah. but I knew her outside of pediatric care. I used to go to the church. I used to go to uh, Starlight Baptist Church. Now mm -hmm. she know who I, who I'm talking about when I say when I say Starlight Baptist Church. I went to church with her, both of her daughters, her son. Um, I knew everybody. I used to call her uh, Miss Maybe mm -hmm. all my life, Miss Maybe. Yeah. I go to adult care, and I and I seen her, and I was surprised to see her. 
outside of pediatric care. And it gave me a sense of relief because yeah. since I had got transitioned um, from pediatric care to adult care, it's just been like nonsense. You know, I, I had to deal with doctors who had never dealt with sickle cell patients before, that didn't know what to do. There was only one hematologist, um, Dr. Johnson Haynes, God rest the dead, because he, he, you know, he had passed away, but he was the only sickle cell specialist for adults in a whole city of Mobile. And you know what I mean? So he was overwhelmed and he had a lot of stuff going on. His clinic was just, to be frank, just a mess. So, you know, I had, I shopped around for different providers. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, when I went to that clinic and I saw her there, I, I just, I just called about her name. Like, Hey, how you doing, miss? Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. she was like, miss, it's doctor to you. And like that hit me to my core when she talked to me like that. Cause I'm just like, at two, bro, you can't even get like you saw me grow up. You saw you've been knowing me forever. I don't, you know, I done dated your daughter. I don't, you know what I mean? We done been all this, and you just yeah. treat me like I'm nothing. And, and and that was like the first wake up call for me. It's wow. like this is a new world. The second yeah. wake up call, women's and children, US USA women's and children, which I was practically raised at the treehouse. It's a, it's a it's a floor specifically for uh sick children like me and other children yes. got chronic illnesses and stuff like that. And we, yeah. had, we had to sit there um, and that's how we got, that's how I got through grade school. That's how I got uh, through, you know, um, kindergarten through, through fifth grade. Yes. Make sure that the teachers would bring uh, school work and stuff so I wouldn't fall too far behind. They okay. bring, um, they'd bring video games. My first time playing a PlayStation was there. Mm -hmm. It was all that kind of stuff or what have you. Uh, so when I when I turned 19, because people still knew me or what have you, you know, they they kind of like try to wean me away from the women's and children. Like you, you, you're a little bit too old, we're not supposed to let you have it. But it was one doctor. I don't remember her name, but she, you know, it's Alabama. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, it, she was one of them. She had them big old blue eyes. I remember that. She had big eyes. It looked like she, she like God bless her with half her eyelids. Like her eyelids wouldn't always, it wouldn't cover her eyeball up all okay. day. You know what I mean? I don't know what kind of dysfunction that was she had. But she just, you know, but she was upset that I was expressing my pain. Yeah. I was in pain and she was upset that I was showing, <laughs> like, you need to behave yourself. I'm like, girl, if you don't help me, Oh my goodness. I'm help me. I'm okay. coming here for help. They're like I gotta have this etiquette, and it's and it's, yeah. that goes right back to to um this whole thing we was talking about earlier with the, that balance between the things that are socially that's going on around you and what's internally going on around you. That you yes, can't I can't control. I can't help. I have a sickle cell crisis. I can't yeah. help. It's hurting me this bad. Yeah, you know I'm, I'm sorry if it makes you uncomfortable to see. Uh, at, at that point, you know, when when, when you're a 19 year old boy, uh, they looking at a grown man. Yeah, you know, yeah. A grown black man. This mm -hmm. grown black man up here crying, acting a fool. You know what I mean? You need to clean up your act. And she kicked me out of the hospital. Figure mm -hmm. it out on your own. Wow. And she told me to go. She told me to go to uh to USA, the adult one. And I ended up, I ended up going there, and it took me like hours to be seen. And oh my goodness! When I got up in there, uh, I when I got up in there, they they did me, they did me dirty. <laughs> they wow! Did me dirty. Uh, I had, uh, I used to have two chest syndrome real bad, and I I knew they knew better in USA. Yeah, a lot of people who I had already knew, like Hiram and Kyle, they were yes. older than me, so they. You know, at, at the association, you know, all of us, they got all the people who had sickle cell disease together. Yes. At the Sickle Cell Disease Association, the chapter. And um, we all like got together after school. Yeah. Um, and you know, so so I, I knew that that's where they went, you know, to, yeah. to be seen. And so I knew that they knew better. But it's like a cardiologist up in there who was mad as crap because he didn't know what what, what to do. Why did they call him in there? Yeah. Because in his head, he, uh, they told him that um, I had some sort of advanced cardiovascular disease or something. I don't know. But yeah. the man, he, I'm like, why are you sending in this guy 
And I'm dealing with a sickle cell crisis. I and, and at that time, I did have acute chest syndrome. It was just a mess. It was, yeah. It's just, <laughs> and this it was, and it's it sounds it, it seems like it well navigating the the healthcare system and you know physicians who are not knowledgeable about sickle cell is. Um, really frustrating. And I think even just shedding more of a light on just how much more, you know, representation that we need and in healthcare leadership and just understanding of these diverse diseases. Uh, and uh, this, you know, I saw a question in the chat that kind of, that's going to actually, that's jumping ahead, jumping ahead, but also helping me with what the next question I wanted to ask. You know, um, you experience all of this, uh, you know, with sickle cell disease, you and you, you learn about um, a clinical trial um, for gene therapy. And, um, we just like to hear a little bit more about that. And I, I had a question, but I, I'll take, uh, Mr. Tony Wafers and he, he asked, you know, well, well, I'll ask what led you to consider participating in a clinical trial for sickle cell disease? Um, knowing the history around research, people of color, African-American, um, issues like Tuskegee and, um, you know, other uh, malpractices and unethical practices in research that have really negatively impacted people in the Black community. Um, what led you to be, you know, open to participating and being involved in a clinical research um, specifically for yourself? Um, first off, I was dying anyway. Uh, and it's not one of those things like where a doctor was like, hey, you're going to die. I felt it. Uh, I knew something was wrong with me. And I felt vulnerable. And I just knew that if I went through another sickness cell crisis, it was going to be it. And um, it was a very depressing time. But uh, background. Living with sickle cell and being an adult with sickle cell is particularly difficult because you have to be responsible for yourself, meaning that I have to work. Social Security ain't enough. I got to work. Uh, I have to pay my own bills. I got to pay my car note. I got to do all these things. And so I went through a cycle from the age of 19 up until around, I say, 25. I went through a cycle of starting over, building back up, starting over. And each time I got crashed, it was because of the disease. I get a job working here at somewhere like a Lorca, Pilot, you name it, McDonald's. I worked many a jobs, worked at the state docks. I worked many a jobs. And then I do great. I'm like, my, work my work ethic is great. I have a sickle cell crisis. And I'm out for about a week or two being hospitalized, right? And I don't even give my chance, my, myself the chance or the grace to recover. Because you know, it takes a time, it takes a while after you get hospitalized, going through whatever, you know, all that pain medicine and all the other stuff that they have to deal with you to, to get you right. It takes a while to recover. I didn't even give myself a chance. I go straight to work because at the time I can't afford to lose this job. Um, but they they let me go because they don't they think I'm bull they think I'm bullshitting with them. You know, they think, oh, you just coming up with some other excuse or what have you. Well, sick sickle cell ain't like that. I'm did my research. You don't know, brother. <laughs> you don't know. And so I just I, I lose that job, meaning I lose that car, I lose that apartment, and now I'm homeless and I gotta start all the way over again. And I went through that cycle a whole bunch, and at that time. I was going to Bishop State because I had figured in my mind a way to escape that cycle was for me to educate myself and equip myself with a trade. Yeah. So I went to school to be an electrician. And I'm like, yo, I'm going to get this trade and ain't nothing sickle cell can do can stop me from living. If I if I, if I get fired, if I become a part of a union, become a part of the, the, the local union or what have you, and I tell them what's going on, they can't just fire me for no reason. You know, Alabama's like one of those at will, you know, states where they just fire you and they're just like, I just don't want you. So uh, I, got, I got tired of being thrown away like that. And I didn't have anybody to depend on like that. So, um, you know, and then when I went, when I went through, uh, I went through a sickle cell crisis in a very key moment um, in school and they, they wouldn't allow me 
to retake my finals or they wouldn't give me that chance. Even though I had signed up for the disability thing in school, you know, in college, you are supposed to give you that grace. They didn't give that to me. And I just mm -hmm. said, I, I was, I was suicidal. I was, I was going to kill myself, but something in me, uh, some in me made me want to fight. And yeah. I had a memory um, about bone marrow transplant that uh that I remember uh, somebody shopping around at the uh in, in pediatric when I was in pediatrics uh and I thought like I wonder how far along they got with that and that's when I googled NIH and um I got to looking into it and um I I was disqualified from the bone marrow thing um I didn't qualify for that um so they pitched to me gene therapy they explained to me what it was. And they told me what the risks were. And I just kind of like hopped on it as fast as I could because I yeah. didn't think that I was going to make it through that next winter. Because it's like every winter I went through, uh, I have acute chest syndrome. And each time, like for years, it, it just got worse and worse and worse. I felt myself depreciating. And I just like, I, I'm, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I'm going to die swinging. I'm not going to just take this. So... Yeah. You know, that's that's kind of that's kind of how I looked at it. I didn't think about all the other implications. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, I couldn't afford to just sit there and look skeptical. Hey, look, it's I'm gonna die regardless. Might as well try. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I was at peace with that. I was at peace with dying, but I wanted to die on my own terms, and I didn't want to just be just hopeless and pathetic. Yeah. So, um, gene therapy was. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Lindrick. Um, yeah, I uh, I had some other questions, but I, I'm actually going to transition a little bit here because I know a lot of folks have questions for you. And um, I, I'm going to transition over to um, some of the folks on the call. If there are any questions... You, you have that you want to direct to Lindrick, um, please feel free to ask them. So, Ejiro, there are some questions in the chat. In the chat. Um, from Tony um, Rayford has a question. Tony, are you, can you uh, unmute? And I think you have a few questions. Yeah. Sure. Brother. Thank you. I love the fact that I love your testimony. I, I really am excited to see a brother to get on here and talk like this, because usually it's the sisters that's always taking the lead and to see a brother and keeping it and, and just keeping it real and being honest about your journey, man. That's I got to applaud you on that, brother. A couple of questions, actually. One, did the culture, in other words, the, the, the doctor being black or white or whatever, did that in any way influence your, you in terms of maybe wanting to get involved in the trial or not getting one involved in the trial? That's one. The other trust, the other question is, you know how we kick it. I would say barbershop, but I can look at you and tell you don't go there too often. Just like my hair used to be black. <laughs> what, what what do you often tell your story? You know, because as you know, brother, I mean, you know, in the shop, barbershop and other places that we hang is where we share information. Do you often what what venue do you use to talk about your journey amongst the brothers and tell it in your own special way, like you're doing today? Those two questions are really important to me. I'm really curious about. And and oh, let me add to that. And and have you having gone through it? Did you see that it make you? Did it make you a better advocate for your own health in terms of you know? How sometimes we go to the doctor, we trip and we scared and don't know what to say and all that. Did it did it did it help you in terms of being able to navigate and deal with your own health? and teach other folk in the community and, and family and friends how to do that? Okay, let me start off with the first question uh, about, you know, uh, people people of our color yeah. <laughs> and uh, positions. Uh, uh, uh. Well, I'm from Mobile, Alabama. It's a predominantly black city. So most okay. of the positions I dealt with, uh, especially through our pediatric care, and Dr. Johnson Haynes were African-American. Uh, okay. The, the, I went to church. It's Mobile, mm -hmm. Alabama. Everything segregated just, just about still to this day. So if I'm going to church, it's a black church. So that doctor right. who, who I saw in pediatric care and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. switched on me, that was a black doctor. Uh, I think that's more of a cultural thing of, for, for mm -hmm. Mobile 
because in my travels, I've seen um, difference, big differences. You know what I'm saying? Uh, right. So, so I, I, I don't want to discredit, you know, that just because, you know, it was our people. I think just the, the culture mobile is very messed up, man. It's mm -hmm. crab bucket city. And, um, and so it's a lot of different, it's, it's an additional social hurdles you got to uh, right. go through just besides just the racial boundaries. You got to deal with colorism. You got to deal right. with a lot of just, just ignorance for no reason. They still in the 1960s back there, man. So uh, uh, to the other question, uh, how do I, how do I, <laughs> how do I advocate? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as soon as I got out of gene therapy, I felt like it was my appointed duty to go out there and start. I, love it. I went to Fort Wayne, Indiana. I went um, anywhere someone would wanted to know what to do. I still, to this day, I get messages on TikTok and Facebook and Instagram um, about what's going on. And really, what I've, what I've noticed a, a commonality is that people just really want hope. And mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that, hey, they want to get put on game and just, you know, get a gene therapy too, because it's scary. Most yeah. people who come to me and ask me about gene therapy, they, they're not asking because they're looking into getting, getting, you know, getting into the program themselves. They're asking because they're like, wow, you did that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I can't believe you did that. They're looking at me like that. So really what they come into these young, especially younger um, people who dealing with sickle cell, they're looking up to me for hope. Like, yeah. you, know, you really live in life? Are you what are you doing with this opportunity? Are you making the most out of it? what are you? Because if I had it, I'll do this and I'll do that. Um, but also there's another, there's another, there's a there's a flip side to it. I've met other people with sickle cell who almost treated me with a degree of shame, like you know, like I gave up my identity because I gave up sickle cell. And you right. know, I have people approach me at uh different community events that I would attend, uh, um, speaking about sickle cell in Mobile. Um they would approach me saying, you know, oh shoot, it could be me. You better than me. And you already know what that means, brother, when they when they say yeah, it like that. Right, right. Yeah. Me. You know what I'm saying? And, and I and I and I look at them and I I, I look at them with grace because they really mm. don't understand. But on the inside, I'm just like, you damn right, I'm better than you. <laughs> I, <laughs> you like that. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you crazy. Yeah. What you doing? What you holding on for? Why you holding on to things that's killing you? And you know what? I find that that to be, I don't know why is unique about our people, no matter where we are in the country, in the world. Mm -hmm. In Africa, name the country in Africa. You mm -hmm. hold on to things that kill you, that are meant to destroy your community, that are meant to destroy your culture, that are meant to destroy your identity. Oh. And, even, and even when it comes down to something that is physically destroying you, you yeah, hold right. on to it because of little tidbits of crumbs that you get from it. I, I'd rather, I'd rather die. And that's exactly the attitude you got to have in order to survive. You know, you, you, you got to get to the point to where you, 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 you find a rock, mm -hmm. this is where I'm going to be at, mm -hmm. you want to take me off of it, you got to kill me. Yeah, well. No other way. You can't have no attitude prancing around it, trying to care about somebody else's feelings and, mm -hmm. and who you're going to offend and how people are going to view you and stuff like that. This is my life. Right. This is my life. There's yeah. one thing about it. Everyone on this, everyone on this planet knows we all gonna die. It's gonna come for us. That's a guarantee. We're gonna die. But for me, mm -hmm. since a child, I've been facing my mortality. Since a child, mm. as a kid, I've been facing my mortality. So for me, my perspective about life and death is a, is I don't think it's that unique. I think that it's just different because people have the luxury of, of thinking about everything else, about Cardi B and Offset breaking mm -hmm. up. And, uh, mm -hmm. Everything else is going on. You forget that at the end of the day, yo, this that's the end to this. Mm -hmm. So for me, my perspective has always been, how do I want to go out? Mm -hmm. What am I going to die about? If I'm going to die for something, I don't want to die for nothing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to die for nothing. So I'm, you know, um, I, I know I gave you a lot on that. And it's no, you gave me all I needed, brother. That's what I wanted to hear, the real. Thank you, brother. That's, that's where I'm at, man. And, and I, wanted I, feel to you. Ask, I wanted to ask, um, Lynn Drake, and I know a lot of people are feel I want to know, you know, um, what what can you kind of describe the the process of the clinical trial? Like what what 
was a typical day like for you? What was that experience like? Okay. Um, well, it was pretty much a basic process. Um, mm -hmm. They had to collect the cells. They had to collect mm -hmm. enough valuable cells for them to uh, to modify. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that meant that I had to get hooked up to an apheresis machine and they had to draw a lot of blood, a whole mm -hmm. lot of blood. Uh -huh. But before they did that, they needed to put me through blood exchanges. So, um, you know, I mean, I'm pretty sure uh, a lot of you guys are familiar with that. It's like where uh, they also hook you up to an apheresis machine. They, they pull out the bad blood, you know, which is the simple blood, and they, they dump in um, healthy blood, healthy blood so that I can live. Because mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to survive the process without that, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So people who donate blood, thank you. Because I would not have made it through through the gene therapy process uh, without that blood. Because um, yeah. my, my disease at that point, and I, I, I didn't think I mentioned that, but, you know, you had to get, uh, I had to get screened. Um, mm -hmm. So after I did all the emails and talked to all the people, uh, they flew me out to Bethesda, Maryland, where NIH is, and um, I got, I had an interview with Dr. Shea, and Dr. Shea had a series of tests ran on me, and so what they were looking for was, they was looking for somebody who was going to be strong enough to survive, but not so, that health can't be so great, because if my health was too great, I'm like, well, this is too big of a risk mm -hmm. for us to take putting you through gene therapy because you could mm -hmm. die, and your disease isn't that bad, mm -hmm. but my disease was awful. And for some reason, I don't know, just because I'm hard-headed or something, for some reason, I was just too stubborn to do that. So my body, like Dr. Shane sat me down, he was just like, I, I don't think you're going to make it here longer. I really think you need to hurry up and sign up for this. I'm a, I think this is the only option you had. Yeah. And so when he told me that, it just like all the dreams and visions I had about myself dying was just validated right then. I was like, I've been feeling this. I, I knew that if I went through another sickle cell crisis and I had another acute chest syndrome, that I wasn't going to make it out. Yeah. I felt it. And so yeah. that consultation was everything for me. Uh, yeah. So after that, they, they do a whole bunch of, you know, all kind of comprehensive tests and they yeah. found out. That's, I, I didn't find out I had avascular necrosis until I went to NIH. Wow. And that should answer your question, brothers, about the doctors in Mobile. Wow. I didn't find out how severe my disease was until I went outside the state. Mind you, I have been born and raised in Mobile, Alabama, and I have been born and raised in a medical system in Mobile, Alabama, and they have right. done nothing <laughs> practically except give me pain medicine. Wow, that's rough, brother. But but they but they treat you like you a drug drug addict, but it's the only treatment that they give you. They don't mm -hmm. they don't give you any other kind of treatment. They don't I didn't even know what a blood uh exchange was until I went to Maryland. I didn't know mm -hmm. what an apheresis machine was. And then I found out from Maryland, like there's other places like in Philly and even mm -hmm. clinics in Atlanta where people have sickle cell clinics specifically for people who got diseases like sickle cell. And they come mm -hmm. up in there and they get blood exchanges or blood transfusions or they just get fluids just to keep them from going through all this stuff. They ain't got nothing like that in Mobile to this day. Mm -hmm. All they got is and then you got to shop around. You got to shop around and go to different hospitals because Providence ain't going to see you like that. Mm -hmm. so you got to go to Spring Hill Medical Center because yeah. they'll see you quick. They're not going to give you quality care because they got a whole bunch of uh, residential doctors and stuff like that. You never know which doctor you're going to get. And mm -hmm. the doctor I just so happened to have wasn't allowed in Spring Hill. So he couldn't come over there to see me. But Spring Hill Medical Center was the only hospital that was willing to see me. I couldn't go to USA. They sent a freaking cardiologist up in there to see me. And he didn't know what to do. He was mad at me. He was like, why they got me in here? Man, dude, you the doctor. You the one who went to school for I don't know how many years. No. Like, yeah. me. I'm in pain right now, brother. Get out of Come on, brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. You, got, you got to deal with all this humbug just to get something simple as, I don't know, being treated like a human. Yeah, because I've seen, you know, with me being raised in the medical system, I've seen all these other people around me. I, I've mm -hmm. seen people of other ethnic origins come yeah. into the emergency room for something trivial. Yeah, they go to the triage. They go over there to the back to the to the hospital bed, and then they get and, and they get treated like they just guys get the earth. They got the same health. They got Medicaid like I got Medicaid. Yeah, right. top dollar. 
They insurance ain't no different than mine, but they getting treated right. better than me. Yeah, oh, wow. And yes. I'm over here dying. And I can't mm. tell you how many times I almost I Yeah. I can't tell you how many times God has shown grace. Come on, bro. Spared me from, from, from the devices and ignorance of other people. Okay. It's bad you to do what you're doing right now, black man. Ain't, ain't no reason, ain't no rhyme or reason for me to be still living here alive. Ain't no real rhyme or reason for me to have been able to survive thus far to be able to get treated in Maryland the way I did. I, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I kind of told you. Yeah. And in, in the gene therapy, it was pretty much just blood exchanges. So I was there every three months. No, every month. Every month. I was so bad that I had to go every month for blood exchanges. Yeah. So uh, they had to give me blood exchanges every month. And um, they would give me a drug called Plerisophor. And Plerisophor would release stem cells in my bloodstream so that while they're giving me my blood exchanges, they're, uh, they're collecting my cells at the same time. So wow. they didn't have to keep on giving me bone marrow aspirations and, and biopsies in order to collect my, my stem cells. They needed that when they got more cells that way. Um, mm -hmm. And after they collected... I think it was about three million samples that mm -hmm. that, was, that that survived the modification. Once they collected that, mm -hmm. uh, that's when they prepared me for transplant. Wow! Um, I had to go through busulfan. Um, this is you know it was a very strong chemo that they give to leukemia patients. I had to go mm -hmm. through three days of that mm -hmm. and, um, just to wipe out the the. Just imagine like your your body. Is like a factory that produces all your cells in your body, mm -hmm. all the cells. And busulfan shuts that factory down. Yeah. And so uh, for those who don't know, um, you know, your blood cells only live for so long. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cells yeah. live in your body for so long. So once that factory shut down, there's a timeline that got before, you know, yeah. you get transplanted. So yeah. we're five minutes away from the yeah. hour. There's two questions. I've also just also dropped a link for today <laughs> that we would like you guys to fill out. So if you can uh, look at your chat and click on the link, um, I'll, uh, Dr. Brown or Dr. Norris, whoever um, is unmuted first can talk. And, and I think Nor have Norma okay. has her hand up. So, yes, I'll give yeah. it Norma. And so I know that, um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Holmes, for just an amazing discussion. <laughs> um, I think we all learned a huge amount. I'll tell you what my question is, and I want you to, I want to make sure Norma um, uh, talks as well, as well as Keith. Um, you know, I, I'd love for you to think about what you would tell primary care doctors like myself, other doctors who are on the, the uh, call, people in the healthcare system, what would you change? So you can think about that. We can talk about it afterwards because I think we need your input into how to make this system better. For people who really need the system. Um, and then I want to make sure that Norma, I know that you had been, you'd had a comment or a question that you'd wanted to ask. Um, I, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you're able to come in and talk today. And I, I worked with sickle cell awareness campaigns from back in the 60s. I was a member of the Black Panther Party, and we were some of the first folks who got out and started, you know, exposing how our people were continuing to die. They're not getting uh, medication. There was no money in research. There was nothing. And I see that, that that didn't do very much for Mobile and probably some other places down there. But I, I'm grateful that that you've made it this far. I, mm -hmm. I've worked with people and, and um, had friends who had sickle cell. I, I know what the crisis is like and how they go to the hospital emergency room and the doctors would tell them, oh, this is just a uh, drug seeking behavior because they would be able to tell the doctor exactly what would work for them. They've been taking pain meds since they were babies. And they would just tell them, oh, oh no, I'm, I'm not gonna give you that. You just wanna get drugs to get high. And, the, I mean, and that kind of uh, thing is still going on. So we got a lot of work still to do with, with the, the medical professionals. Um, but I, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here and you're able to do this. I, my baby boy who's, uh, 50 now uh, has a trait, but his um, his biological mom died from sickle cell. His big sister and his uncle, um, and uh, they all passed away from sickle cell. And thank God he's still here. He's he's my gift from God. And uh, keep on doing the work. Uh, just and I know that the the sickle cell has been like a curse, but on the other hand, it's been like a blessing to others because you're able to go out and spread this word and, and to help other people get involved in the clinical trials and whatnot so that they can have a better life. 
So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Scott, you to yeah, I was just going to echo that, um, Mr. Holmes. Thank you very much for your presentation. And yeah, for you know, as you said, sometimes you don't know why you're alive. Um, for me, it's you're living into it now. You know, you're you're alive to be a messenger for many who don't have the voice that you've been able to cultivate um, through all these trials and tribulations. And 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 yes, it's a uh, your journey clearly has been harder than many, but because of that. What you have to give back is much greater than what many have to give. And so uh, we appreciate the fact that that you're doing this. And, um, you know, it's, it's really important for, for our community. Um, it's, a, it's a great role model even for other communities. And we just thank you for coming and sharing with us and for being who you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. And I know we're at the hour. Um, if you can just share um, one final word or message, and I know Dr. Brown had that one question for, I mean, I, did you have a chance to think through it, um, the message to any healthcare providers? Yes, I mean, I've already thought about this. I've probably said this more times. Yeah. Now. Uh, number one, I think you should lean on the science. I, I think uh, there's a, there's too much focus on you know what kind of person this is and a third. I, I feel like you should trust the science. That's number one because that's not going to like the facts are, are are the facts. You know you see what's going on, treat that. You know, um, but I do understand that uh, it is a people business, and you there are certain things you just science is not going to do, and you kind of just you need to be able to read you know people or what have you. The only other advice I have is I think there needs to be a uh, cultural uh, awareness, you know, cultural humility, uh, because people deal with pain. Pain is very unique. It's like a finger point. People express themselves and, and, and how they deal with pain and stuff like that very differently. Yeah. And so yeah. it, it'd be better, in my opinion, to, if you, if you have to, to make a judgment uh, of how to treat someone if you have to based on how to present themselves look at it from where they come from culturally or social economic status you know what i mean because some people just like i said they, they're not going to be able to articulate they come from a, a different culture where it's just it's just different those are the number two things those are the two things that i've seen from my experience that i i feel that it's lacking from providers because you come in a lot of times i've seen a lot of providers come in with this presumption that, you know, I'm just going to get it. No, I come from a whole different world. <laughs> come a whole different world. I don't know your language. I don't, I don't, you know, there's a cultural difference there, number one. And number two, I'm trusting your knowledge. I'm trusting your education. I'm trusting your expertise, you know? So I, I'm, I'm expecting you to fill in the gaps of ignorance that I have and fill it with knowledge. So that's the reason why I said number one is trust the science. I don't think the science fails. Look at what it got us here. Sickle cell free, baby. All I got is a trait. I ain't got SS no more. <laughs> 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 Look what the science can do. So I, I, I believe in the science and I think that if you lead with the science, then more, more humanity will be shown because that's what it's all about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lendrick. Um, I know we're at the hour a little bit over a minute. I just wanted to extend a huge thank you um, to you for sharing your incredibly inspiring journey with all of us, um, your experiences and your insights into to gene therapy and, you know, just your personal experience overall with this disease and the treatments. Um, they're not just enlightening, but truly a beacon of hope for many people that are facing similar challenges. And um, to the audience, thank you all for tuning in and engaging with this important discussion and your interest and support um, really play a crucial role in, in shedding light on breakthrough treatments and um, the real true human stories behind them. Um, so thank you again. And I'll just hand it over to um, Amon and Dr. Brown for any like last final notes. But thank you all. And thank you so much, Lindrick. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask people to please, please, please fill out the survey, maybe put it in the chat again. Um, we want, do we'd love to have, uh, I don't think we'll ever have a session like this again, um, because uh, you are truly unique. And I think you've brought a perspective 
that is important for everyone doing research, everyone practicing medicine, everyone who is a patient, you know, and I think this has been invaluable for me and I think for everyone in our on our team. So uh, we look forward to reaching out to you again. We'd love to hear more from you because uh, clearly this, uh, what you've learned, what you've experienced could fill well more than the hour that we have. Um, and I really wanna echo the sentiments in the chat from everybody who I think has uh, commented that this has been um, uh, uh, truly an amazing discussion. Uh, Keith, do you have anything you wanna add or, or Juan or Michael? No, I, I I echo what you said. I you know I had I had my comments about um, you know the fact that you're living into into your purpose right now, or at least into into a higher purpose that is you've been called to serve, and and we're appreciative of that. Uh, definitely look forward to having you come back and and share your wisdom and knowledge with us, and uh, and on a personal level, glad that your your health is so much better now and. And that the science has worked for you, and you know, and and relieving some of your pains that you've had over time, and and you know, we're glad for that as well. Yes, I can't echo enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll cut and paste some of the comments from the uh, chat, and we'll email them to you so you can be aware of what people are saying as we are having our discussion. Once again, thank you very much, everyone, for everything, and we look forward to seeing you guys next month.